Okay. Uh, so this is for second hour on 19th of April. <clears throat> Do what? It's not a now. Well, this is the this is the moment. This is the moment. Shot heard around the world. Lexington, Massachusetts. Ms. Warren, yes. could you come here and help me just yes. a minute, please? I don't know if I can, but the Well, you can. Uh -huh. It's a Soviet cosmonaut, and I want to, no, I, I call it Gagarin, but that may not be the correct pronunciation. How do you pronounce that last name? Yuri Gagarin. Gagarin. Mm -hmm. Well, I was close. You were very close. Okay. Thanks. Uh -huh. You're welcome. Go to the source when you have a question. <laughs> She's your Ukrainian, and at the time Kennedy was president, uh, the Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union. Anyway, she was born in the Soviet Union. Interesting. Uh, anyway, uh, the, the space race. Let's take that up today because that's going to uh, be a big part of the Kennedy administration. And by the way, even the space race has become a theater of the Cold War. In other words, we were trying to outdo the Soviets, and by the time Kennedy became president, Clearly, the Soviets were ahead. And, of course, you've got to go back to the one-upmanship of the Cold War, the psychology of the Cold War. Uh, and, and, of course, the big question when John Kennedy was, became president was who would reach the moon first, the capitalists or the communists? And, of course, underlying all of this is that the whole space race is about rocket boosters. It's our ability to go out here, and now they're empty, but you go out to a little old backwater town in western Oklahoma called Burns Flats, and you can go out in the wheat fields and you can see the missile silos out there. And, you know, how do we make ourselves able to launch a nuclear mess missile from Burns Flat, Oklahoma? And I assure you, there's not much to Burns Flat. How do you launch that and land it right in the Kremlin in the middle of Moscow? Well, you say you're engaged in just this friendly space race, but the underlying cause of that is you're trying to develop rocket boosters, okay? And the Soviets were ahead. What was the, you know, why do I say the Soviets were ahead by 1961? They already launched Sputnik. Sputnik, launched. very good, in 57. And guess what? In 1961, on the, in April the 12th, they went up this again because uh, they launched, this is in 1961, this is the year Kennedy becomes president, they launched the first manned space flight, first human being. The so we didn't do it. The Soviets sent... The first, and by the way, we've got astronauts, I mean, you may want to do that. We've got astronauts, the Soviets had cosmonauts, okay? Cosmonauts, and the first man in space, write this guy down, Yuri Gagarin. Yuri Gagarin, Soviet Union. He circled the Earth for 89 hours. That's no big deal today, but he circled the Earth, 
Can you see that? Uh, can you see that? Not really, no. Well, just tell me. Gagarin, Yuri, okay? He circled the Earth for 89 hours, okay? 89 hours. That would be no big deal today, but it was huge then. And when he, they finally, he lands in the ocean. They send this Soviet ship out to retrieve him. They bring him back to Moscow. And they stood him up on Lenin's tomb, okay, in Red Square. And they gave him a, a 21-gun salute and half the Soviet army marched by. Well, of course, JFK was clearly worried about this. You know, here's a, another area he said that they are ahead of us. And he suggested uh, a Manhattan Project-like thing to get us not just up and running in the space program, but get up. And what am I talking about, the Manhattan Project? When they were testing the first When we created the first atomic bomb. I mean, look, in 1941, we find out Germany's ahead of us in developing an atomic bomb. Who developed the first atomic bomb? Not Germany, thank goodness, but us. Uh, because we had this project that we formed. Today it would be billions into, and uh, in about in a few months we have an operational atomic bomb. And Kennedy said that's what we've got to do here to catch up with the Soviets in this space race. And so just three weeks after Gagarin circles, three weeks, 21 days after Gagarin circles the Earth, we fired, we sent our first man into space on a spacecraft called. Uh, Freedom 7, okay? And this man right here, and he's an astronaut, Alan B. Shepard, write that down. Freedom 7, Freedom 7. I mean, we just felt like we've got to do something. He was only in space for 15 minutes. I mean, we fired him out and then brought him back, and he lands in the ocean. Alan B. Shepard, our first astronaut ever, the first American astronaut launched into space. But the, you know, just 15 minutes, but the American people were overjoyed. In fact, in Indianapolis, Indiana, there was a court cop trial going on. A guy had stolen a television. And they had the television right there in the courtroom, but the judge, you know, one of his assistants came in and said, Your Honor, they're about to make that, fire that rocket into space with Alan B. Shepard. And so the judge called a 20-minute recess and he had them set the TV up that they had in there for evidence. So the burglar and the jury and the, the, the two attorneys and the judge could all stand there in the courtroom and watch Alan B. Shepard take off and then come back in 15, 15, minutes, 15 minutes later, okay? Uh, well, in 1962, get this down, John Glenn, this man, John Glenn, uh, became the first American to orbit the Earth. The first person, because that was Yuri Gagarin, uh, John Glenn, and his spacecraft was called Friendship 7, and you can go to the Air and Space Museum and the uh, Smithsonian and almost crawl right into the thing. There are kids crawling all over. There sits the first American spaceship to orbit the Earth. And boy, the Americans were here. Listen, when he lands, they pull him out of the ocean. There he is. There he is. Kennedy goes down, you know, he, you know, he wants it, and there's the space, that's in the Smithsonian, that thing right there, Friendship 7, and uh, there's John Glenn, and there's Kennedy, boy, Kennedy's really interested in this space race, and John Glenn is over his shoulder telling him all the facts and figures about it, I guess, uh, but uh, Kennedy, he goes before the Congress in 19, and by the way, John Glenn's been around a long time, uh, he eventually becomes the U.S., you got to write this down, but the U.S. Senator for the state of Ohio, that's where he was from, uh, and uh, in 1998, you know, he's almost 80 years old, but he participated in the flight of uh, the space shuttle, okay? He was in space for the rest of his life. Well, in 1960, this all happens in 61. In 1962, Kennedy goes before the Congress, and he said that the United States, and I quote, should land a man on the moon before the end of this decade, end quote, and the United States did in August of 19. Uh, in August of 1969. You know, we used to do great things in this country. We squabble about taxes, and I don't know what else we fight about today, elections, but we used to do great things. Here we were clearly behind the Soviets, and there's only one nation up until this, you know, the Chinese have said we're working on it. The Russians have tried it. They never accomplished it. The United States 
has, uh, because in 1969, on July the 20th, uh, I remember that date very, very well. There he is, right in down, Neil Armstrong. July 20th, 1969, I was a sophomore in high school, and uh, I remember that, just about the time we were starting, about to start school in August, you know, and, and I remember people going, and I'm among those, going out and standing in the yard looking when it was a full moon, and we just thought, they're human beings, you know, I don't have you look at the moon, but they're human beings up there walking around right now. This was one of the greatest moments uh, in United States, United States history. Uh, and there is the uh, spacecraft, uh, there's the area, there's the spacecraft uh, approaching the moon, uh, and there they are. And that flag is still with a brass plaque up there saying that men from Earth came here in 1969. There's about to be another one up there, but there's only one flag on the moon, and it's, it's the American flag. Neil Armstrong and his crew walked on the moon. And of course, uh, when uh, he fight, when he there he is. When he landed, that's him. On, when he landed on the moon, uh, he sent uh, a, a radio transmission. When he stepped out of the the, uh, the uh, spacecraft, he sent a radio transmission back to the Earth, back to NASA in Houston, and he said, and I quote, "One small step for a man, one giant step for mankind." End quote. That was the message from the moon. That's just amazing. Uh, that's just amazing. And by the way, his spacecraft, get this down, was Apollo 11. Apollo 11. And by the way, this makes him the equivalent to Columbus or Magellan. He literally opened up a new world. This was Kennedy's new frontier, although Kennedy had been dead for six years. This is the, you know, Kennedy said we need to go to the moon by the end of the decade. Well, the United States did it. Eight years after Kennedy made that speech, there was a man on the moon and no one else has ever been there. And what does that prove? It proves, proves, and it proved that the United States was the most powerful nation in the world. We're the only nation that could do that. We were the leader of the world. We can do what this is saying to the world, who's watching this conflict called the Cold War. It's saying we, the United States, can do things that no other nation in, in the world can do. And of course, that's a great victory, to put it mildly, for the United States during the Cold War, so the space race. And also civil rights, get this down. I want to talk about civil rights during the Kennedy administration. You know, if John F. Kennedy could have clapped his hands and everyone in this country would have been equal, he'd have done it. He didn't like segregation. He wanted segregation abolished. You just don't understand. This country was segregated and had been since the Civil War, but he couldn't do that because he also wanted to get his program passed through the Congress. And here's the way it works. I know people think that the president, if he wants something done, simply, simply calls some senator in his party and says, get up on the floor of the Senate and get up and propose this bill. And the senator does it, and they start debating, and then they vote, and it goes to the House. And the, uh, that's not the way it works. Uh, the president of the United States, uh, if uh, he wants a bill passed to strengthen the defense of the United States, uh, he will propose a bill, and the bill will go, you're right, at this point, it will go to the Congress. Uh, and uh, it will go usually to the House first, and the House has a committee called the House Armed Services Committee. And I don't know how many people, probably there are 25 people on it. Uh, and uh, the majority of the people right now in the, in the House would be Republicans. They'd have 13 or 14 Republicans and 10 Democrats, okay? Uh, and, you know, they will look at the president's bill. Uh, and every committee has a chairperson, okay, a man or a woman who's the chairman. And I'll tell you what, chairperson, and these chairpersons are very powerful people. Uh, they can literally kill a bill almost by themselves. They can refuse to bring it before the committee. Uh, so if you're president of the United States, you have to constantly be cultivating these chairpersons of these committees if you want your bill. But they'll call witnesses and they will uh, question those witnesses and then they will vote as to whether or not this ought to be sent over to the Senate for them to commit. And this isn't a vote on the bill. This is just committee work. And if it gets to the House Armed Services Committee, it will go to the Senate uh, and they have an Armed Services Committee. Okay, I'm not going to write that out again. And the process, and, and every committee has a chairperson, 
And right now, the Democrats, by one or two votes, control the Senate, so this would be a Democrat. Uh, the chairperson here would be a Republican, and they go through the process again. And if this committee, you know, votes to uh, send it on to the full Senate, then it goes to the Senate, and they have a debate. And the Senate will either vote it up or down. And if they vote it up, then it goes to the House. And at any time, they can change anything about it. The Senate may add some stuff to it. It goes over to the House. The House says, it, says we don't like that. And so there will be a committee that meets in the middle called the Conference Committee of Democrats and uh, or members from the House and the Senate. And they will try and hammer out the bill. The House will say, we don't like what you added to the bill. You need to take it out. And they'll debate about that. And finally, uh, you know, when the bill is satisfactory to both houses, if both houses pass it, then it goes to the president and he either signs it or he vetoes it. But it's a long and drawn out process. And those committee chair, are you with me? Those committee, you know, these bills go through committees and that takes a while. And that's good, by the way. Uh, I never cease to be amazed at Americans who want everything done just like that. The founding fathers made it a slow process. So you don't make some knee-jerk decision when you're mad or you're happy or whatever uh, uh, and pass some bill that either they wanted it to be a slow process. They, and it is. And thank goodness that it is. So people you know, who might act rationally have a little time to step back, cool off, and think about it before they cast their final vote. That's one of the great secrets of our success. But we want everything done by Sunday. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> or a lot of people do, I guess. Anyway, you got to keep these committee chairmen happy, or if you send the bill over there, it doesn't have much of a chance of making it. We'll get this down. When John Kennedy was president, we're talking about civil rights. When John Kennedy was president, I'm certain he wanted to send civil rights bills over to the Congress, and he will. But most of these committees, get this down, most of these committees, well, were headed by Southerners, Southern segregationists. You know, who's the chairman? How do you have to be chairman? You serve on the committee of the long seniority. And a lot of these committees were headed by Southerners and they were segregationists. So if Kennedy says, if I take a strong, strong stand on civil rights, I won't get anything through the Congress. Okay? He feared that if he pushed civil rights too hard, it would kill all of his other programs. So Kennedy, I think you have to say, has a pretty tepid approach to civil rights. His successor, Lyndon B. Johnson, who was a Southerner and who had been a segregationist, he changed, but he will get, Kennedy proposes, finally Kennedy will propose the civil rights bill in 1963, and while he's trying to get through these committees, he's killed. And Johnson will become president, and Johnson will take Kennedy's civil rights bill, and he rams it through the Congress. He rams it through the Congress. He knew how the Congress worked. In fact, when Johnson became the Vice President of the United States, listen, he was one of the most powerful men in the Congress. He knew them all, and he knew how to get a bill through the Congress. And as a result, Lyndon Johnson, not John Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, the former segregationist, will, and who, by the way, regularly in, in the White House, regularly used the N-word, regularly used the N-word. But he will get more civil rights legislation through the Congress than any president to this day. But John Kennedy, uh, you know, had said during the campaign, here's a quote from the campaign in 1960. He said, and I quote, the Negro baby born in America today, regardless of the section of the nation in which he is born, has about half as much chance of completing high school as a white baby. One third as much chance of completing college. One third as much chance of becoming a professional man twice as much chance of becoming unemployed and a life expectancy, which is seven years shorter, and prospects of earning only half as much money in their working career, end quote. That said, you know, so, so, so Kennedy points out civil rights, but that said, get this down, he was angered when he learned in 1961 now here he's trying to do this balancing act. I want to get the new frontier through. I want to get the space program through. But I've got to be careful on civil rights so those Southern chairmen don't kill my other bills. Uh, while he's trying to do this balancing act and strike for civil rights just at the right time, he learned that a group of seven black students 
college students and six white college students, lucky 13 college students. I don't know what college students are thinking about this morning. Probably thank God we've only got a week left of school. But they were members of an organization called CORE. Write this down, CORE. And CORE stood for, you know, college students used to engage in activities that they thought would change the world. And by the way, they did. Uh, CORE, here's the acronym, stood for the Congress of Racial Equality. And these were black and white students, Congress of Racial Equality. And 13 college students, black and white, 13 college students, oh, there's Neil Armstrong's foot making that one small step for mankind. Luckily, they photographed that. Uh, there are some of the core people, okay? Core, the Congress of Racial Equality, they announced, get this down, that they were going to ride from Washington, D.C. to New Orleans on a Greyhound bus to protest segregation in busing in this country. And by the way, today, if people want to go somewhere, they dash down and go to the airport. They're there in a matter of hours. Buses and trains, that's what moved America, uh, American passengers in 1961. So buses were a big, big deal. And they're going to ride all the way from New Orleans, excuse me, Washington, D.C. to New Orleans. Maybe I've got a map of that. And here we go. Look, there's Washington. They're going to ride all the way down to New Orleans. And at every bus stop, they're going to protest segregation. Listen, bus stops in those days were as big as airports. They had everything in them that you see in the Dallas-Fort Worth airport. Everything, you know, that's how important the buses were. Now buses, if you ride a bus, it's a little corner on Main Street, something like that. But these were huge. They were like airports. Uh, every, again, everything you see in the airport, you saw in a bus station. Uh, and everything was strictly, strictly segregated. So they were going to go and they were going to walk into the barbershop. Uh, in a bus stop, a black man, and an all white while on a haircut. And of course, he would be turned down and they would protest. They were going to go to the lunch counters, they were going to go to the uh, coffee shops, and so on and so forth, uh, and protest segregation. Well, uh, they started out in Washington, and everything went okay for them until they, you know, roughly okay. There were people in Virginia who, you know, threw racial epithets at them and cursed them. But uh, everything, uh, uh, you know, goes okay until they reach right there. And it was the first stop in South Carolina at a place called uh, Rock Hill in South Carolina. By the way, get this down. These people are called the Freedom Riders. The Freedom, write this down. They're called the Freedom Riders. And they reached Rock Hill, South Carolina, and three of them were assaulted by whites. But they sort of patch up their wounds, get back on the bus, and they head to Atlanta, and they make it to Atlanta okay. You know, again, people are throwing racial slurs at them and, uh, you know, coming up to them with a threatening look on their face, but they make it through Atlanta, and then right here at Anniston, Alabama, they had just crossed, I was in Anniston not too long ago, uh, in Anniston, Alabama, just across the uh, Alabama line, uh, when they get there, uh, the bus was stopped out on the highway outside of Anniston. The bus was stopped <clears throat> six miles west of Anniston, and they were assaulted by the Ku Klux Klan. And the Klan went on board the buses, dragged them out, whipped them with chains and blackjacks. You know what a blackjack is? You know what a blackjack is? It was a piece of lead about that long and that big around and it would be in a leather case. And people used to carry those in their pockets. And if you got in a fight with someone, you could grab them and pop them in the back of the head and kill them, maybe. At least severely injured. That's what a blackjack was. Uh, some of the Klansmen had pieces of two before that long with four 16-penny nails driven through them, and they were chasing these people down the highway, hitting them again and each time, sticking those nails in their back. We need Gavin Watkins in the office, please. In the back of their necks, okay. Uh, and then they set the bus on fire with the, you know what a Molotov cocktail is? Russian Revolution, a guy named Molotov. 
uh, you know, well, in the Russian Revolution, to make a bomb, you would take an empty bottle and you would fill it up with a flammable liquid and then you would stick a rag down on the top of it and let it soak up some of that and then light it and throw the bottle and it hits the building or whatever and shatters and sets the whole side of the building on fire. That's called the Molotov cocktail, comes from the Russian Revolution. Well, there's what they did. There's the Freedom Rider bus burning right there. And they literally were beating these 13 people, boys and girls, beating these 13 people, or young men and young women. And finally, the Alabama Highway Patrol shows up, and they fire a couple of rounds in the air, and the Klan, Klan retreated. So they're in bad shape. Well, the bus company sends out another bus, and they continue on in their journey uh, to Birmingham, Alabama. And when they got to Birmingham, this is the thing about this, when they got to Birmingham, Alabama, they got to Birmingham, Alabama. The police chief, I want you to write this man down, the police chief <clears throat> at Birmingham, and Birmingham is a substantially sized city. Birmingham, it's this guy right here. His name was Eugene T. You don't have to write that down, but they called him Bull Connor, okay? Uh, Bull Connor. And he was an arch segregationist, and he said that there would be no, there would never be a civil rights demonstration in Birmingham as long as he was chief of police. And nothing would ever be integrated as long as he was chief of police. And when they get there, uh, there are hundreds of people waiting for them at the Birmingham bus station. And when they uh, got off uh, the bus, uh, people began to spit on them and uh, hit them and uh, attacked them, and uh, several of them were injured, and they ran in, some of them, and found some place they could use a phone, probably a pay phone, they used to have those, and they called the police and the ambulances, and the answer from the police station and the ambulances came and said, sorry, all of our employees are sick. They're sick at home, okay? They refused on the orders of Bull Connor to come and help uh, these people. Uh, one woman was seen as they're trying to walk into the bus station. One woman had an infant, a little baby this big, and she was holding her baby up near, you know, here comes this person, a freedom rider walking through, and she's holding this baby up right there, pushing her baby. She wants the baby to kick or hit the freedom rider while she's spinning on the freedom rider, okay? That's how racist they were. Well, if you think that was bad, the next stop was the old capital of the Confederacy. The next stop was the old capital of the Confederacy, which was um, Montgomery, you know, Anniston to Montgomery. And when they got to Montgomery, there was a mob of 3,000 people waiting to attack them. And at Montgomery, they actually set one of the Freedom Riders on fire. They doused him with gasoline and lit. It was a young man, young college student, I wonder how many of our fine, illustrious college students today with their 34s on their ACT would be willing to put their college education on hold to go out and uh, fight for the rights of other people, even if it risks their lives. I wonder if you, I went to OU this morning and stood up in one of those auditoriums and asked all those bright young things, how many volunteers do I have? How many people would come forward? I suspect we wouldn't need much room on the bus. But anyway... Uh, they set one of the Freedom Riders on fire. And uh, finally, at this point, the Attorney General of the United States, get this down, the AG, he's the chief. You know, the Attorney General, just remember this, is the head of the Justice Department. The Justice Department had, uh, has offices all over this country. And the purpose of the Justice Department is to defend your rights. If I ask you, do you have a lawyer, you would probably go, oh, I don't have a lawyer. Yes, you do. We all do. He's called the Attorney General. The Attorney for the General Population. That's what the AG does. If anybody ever tells you, well, you're a woman, or you're a man, or you're black, or you're white, uh, you know, uh, or for whatever reason you can't come in here, just call the Attorney General's office in Tulsa or Oklahoma City and they will come to your assistance, okay? Pretty important stuff. The biggest building in Washington, well, the biggest building is the Department of Agriculture, but the next biggest building in Washington, D.C. is the Justice Department. Uh, and uh, who was Kennedy's Attorney General? Who did he appoint? Good, Marshall. 
Huh? No, Thurgood Marshall sitting over across the street on the Supreme Court. He's got his hands full of the Supreme Court. Not yet. Uh, not from Johnson. So Thurgood Marshall, he's, he's an attorney. for That's an educated guess, but it wasn't him. His brother, Robert. Okay, Kennedy appointed his brother, Robert Kennedy. RFK. Robert Kennedy. Okay. And we'll talk more about him later. But anyway, at this point, the Attorney General gets involved. You notice the president doesn't, but Robert Kennedy does on behalf of the president. And he made a personal phone call to the governor of Alabama and a personal phone call to the governor of Mississippi. And he said, you know, the president would consider it a personal favor if you would provide a safe escort through your states. Just make sure these kids don't get persecuted anymore. And the governor of Alabama and the governor of Mississippi agreed to do it. And they both provided a highway patrol escort and the bus made it to New Orleans. Okay. To say that this episode that I've just described to you had gained natural, national attention is the understatement of the decade. Uh, because shortly after this, the, you know, the, you know, the the sacrifice, and boy, these people literally sacrificed their lives. <clears throat> the cause African Americans to bring cases to the Supreme Court, and the court ruled that segregation in interstate travel, in other words, if you're taking a bus from Oklahoma to Kansas, you can't segregate that bus. Segregation and interstate travel is unconstitutional. I know people think that the civil rights, you know, things were very, very bad, and then the heavens opened up and the angels sang and civil rights dropped out of the sky and everything was integrated. No, civil rights takes over 100 years. And by the way, the struggle's still going on. But civil rights, the end of segregation takes over 100 years. And it was done in small incremental steps, not all at once. Small. It's Rosa Parks in 1956. It's the Freedom Riders in 1961. Slowly but surely, things change. Slowly but surely, things change. The same year, get this down, the same year uh, that the Freedom Riders are, well, excuse me, the year after. Well, the same year that the court rules, what I'm saying. Anyway, 1962, the next year. Uh, a, a Mississippi African American who was an Air Force veteran, he, he coached Yuska, Mississippi, named James Meredith, writing down James Meredith, served his country honorably in the Air Force, and he applied for admission. Meredith, he applied for admission to the 140-year-old University of Mississippi, which is often called Ole Miss. Some of you ought to check out going down there. I've been down there. It's a beautiful campus. Ole Miss was all white, and it had been for 140 years. In fact, their mascot was the Ole Miss Rebels. They were the Rebels. And uh, before every football game, uh, a mascot on a horse dressed like a Confederate officer from the Civil War would ride out into the stadium on that horse, and the band would play Dixie, right, Dixie. Uh, and the fans up in the uh, stands, well, the fans up in the stands, there they are, would wave Confederate flags. 50,000 Confederate flags waving while the band played Dixie. And there had never, ever been a black man to graduate from Ole Miss. Now, uh, in the last 10 years, I'm going to guess, recently, they've changed from the old, no more Confederate flags. They've rewritten, they've got a new fight song. It's no longer Dixie. They started out as the bears or the black bears or something like that. 
uh, and then they changed that. They should have stuck with the black bears. But does anybody know what Ole Miss is today? Uh, hopefully they changed this, but they call themselves now the Land Sharks. Isn't that a lousy stinging? We're the Land Sharks. I think they had a student competition and they all wrote in what they wanted and that one. What were they drinking down there? But anyway, I think they are the land sharks. Anyway, whatever they are. Mississippi was very different in 1961. Uh, and by the way, get this down, Mississippi prided itself that it was thoroughly and completely segregated. They said, we will never integrate. And by the way, 1962, that's eight years after Brown versus the Board of Education. Mississippi called itself, get this down, the closed society. The closed society. They had some signs on their interstate highways that said, you are now leaving the United States and entering the state of Mississippi. Very different. Very different. Well, when James Meredith applied for admission to Ole Miss, first African American to do so, he was turned down. He was turned down. And so he turned to the state director of the NAACP. Okay, and the NAACP is the oldest civil rights organization. Does anybody know what that stands for, the NAACP? The National Association for the Advancement of Colored Persons, the NAACP. You might recall that it was, I think, established in 1902 or 1905. <clears throat> but it fights for the rights of all Americans today, but originally it was established to fight for the rights, it, it was originally established to fight for the rights of uh, African Americans. And so uh, every state had an NAACP chapter. And the man who was uh, in charge of the NAACP, there's James Merritt, by the way, okay, on enrollment day. Those are federal marshals around here. We'll get back to that. Uh, this man, write him down, Medgar Evers. Medgar Evers it was the state chairman of the NAACP. Can you think of a more dangerous job in the world than in 1962 being the Director of the Mississippi NAACP, okay, pretty dangerous job. But Edgar, Medgar Evers, excuse me, Medgar Evers took Ole Miss, he sued the University of Mississippi in federal court in New Orleans. And the federal court ordered the University of Mississippi to admit James Merritt. They said, you have got to admit this black student. And the, the, the Ole Miss and the Mississippi State Legislature said, never, we will never admit a black man to the premier university of this state. And so the federal court started fining Ole Miss, the state of Mississippi, I should say, $10,000 a day, which was an enormous... To me, it's an enormous sum of money now, but it was an enormous sum of money in those days, $10,000 a day until they admitted this black man. And so it was at a standoff. Uh, enter into the picture a retired, enter into the picture a retired uh, army general. I don't have a picture of him. Uh, and you don't have to write his name down. Just a retired army. His name was Edwin Walker. Uh, he, had, he was a general. He had been a general in the U.S. Army. Uh, he lived in Dallas, Texas. He was retired. He was a racist, and he was an arch segregationist. And he's reading about all this in the paper. It's on the television. It's on the radio. And so he takes it upon himself to go to, to Oxford. That's where Ole Miss is. Lovely little town. You ought to go visit that. Oxford, Mississippi. And uh, he put out a statement. You know, here's this militia mentality. If things don't go the way we think it ought to go, well, we'll just arm ourselves and do what we want to do. Because after all, this is America, and we've got freedom. That's that mentality. Uh, and people, you know, we've got freedom. That means I can do whatever I want to do. Did you ever hear anything dumber 
in all your life. But anyway, uh, he says this. It's time we took our country back. He said this Antichrist, I'm quoting him, this Antichrist Supreme Court has pushed us around far too much. And we've got to take our country. In other words, we will take the law in our own hands. And let me just tell you something. That's vigilantism. And you ought to sit down before you join a group like this, like the people who stormed the Capitol because they lost an election. <clears throat> <laughs> you better read the history of vigilantism. If you want if you want anarchy, then just join a vigilante group. That's what this was. And guess what? He puts out a call on the radio for people to get their rifles and their tents and their skillets and canteens and come join him at Ole Miss. And they did by the thousands. They are by the hundreds. I won't say the thousands. They come down. I'm going to finish this. They... The softball girls and managers need to be released at this time. Softball girls and the managers need to be released at this time. So the hundreds of them come down with their guns to Oxford, and the whole country's watching this. Well, and more come to the office, please. On Sunday, September 14, 1962, 400 armed marshals, there they are, there are these people with helmets, and 400 armed marshals escorted James Meredith to the registrar's office. Old Miss finally caved in and said, we will register him. Uh, and that 400, think about it, you want to know what America was like in 1962? The good old days takes 400 federal marshals to enroll one black man at Ole Miss. Uh, and he was enrolled before, the, but, but when word spread that a black man, for the first time in 140 years, had been registered as a student at Ole Miss, get this down, the mob attack. <coughs> they killed two people. Well, when it was all said and done, two people died and 300 were wounded. President Kennedy actually had the troops, the, the 101st Airborne, on standby in Columbus, Georgia. He thought they might have to invade Oxford to enroll one black student at Ole Miss. Uh, and uh, anyway, two killed and 300 wounded to enroll this one black man. A year later, 1963, very quickly, a year later, 1963, Medgar Evers, the NAAC director, had come home. He lived in Jackson. He was a native of Jackson, born and raised in Mississippi. He came home and across the road, the street from his house, oh, here are the Ole Miss students. This is their attitude. Here are the Ole Miss students welcoming. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's another group. Never will we integrate. And there's Meredith being escorted down from the registrar's office. But he goes home one night from his office, and this man. Byron De La Beckwith, his friends called him Delay. Byron De La Beckwith, he was a fertilizer salesman. And he hid across the street in the bushes across from Evers' house. And uh, they had a big picture window at his house and his wife, Merle, and their three or four children were sitting there when they saw the dad's, their small children, they saw their dad's car lights flash in the window, they all jumped up and ran out on the porch to greet their father, and he gets out of the car and he's reaching for his briefcase, and this guy right here shot him with a high-powered rifle and killed him right there in front of his children, uh, and then got in his car and drove away. And of course, he was arrested later. Uh, Aaron Spohr, if you're in the building, please report to the front office. Aaron Spohr to the front office. And they found, he was found innocent by an all-white jury. He got walked free. And he spent the next 30 years as a fertilizer salesman going all over Mississippi saying, killing that black man, he would just brag about it, killing that black man, because he'd been found innocent. We have double jeopardy in this country. You can't be tried twice. If you're found guilt, innocent for murder, you're innocent. I don't care what kind of evidence later comes up, you're innocent. And so he was free, and he went all over Mississippi saying, killing that black man didn't bother me any more than running over a dog, end quote. And he did not use the word black man. Well, the case was reopened by the state of Mississippi in 1994. They couldn't get him for murder, but this time they got him for uh, violating the civil rights of Medgar Evers. 
And this time he was found guilty. There he is as an old man. He was living in Memphis, Tennessee. There he is. And he's found guilty. He's found guilty. And uh, he's sent to prison for the rest of his life. And he died there in 2001. There's an excellent movie called The Ghost of Mississippi. If you so longer, but uh, watch that and it tells the story. Well, the next thing happens, get this down in 1963, and this is where we'll take it up tomorrow. So Ole Miss is integrated. The next big conflict comes next door at the University of Alabama. The University of Alabama. If you watch an Alabama football game, could you imagine the University of Alabama with no black students? You know, because they have an all-white football team. In those days. We'll talk all about that. 